Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Bill Cardalopoulos. I'm the programming coordinator for SPX. I'm also the series editor for the Best American Comics series from Hutton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, we're going to be looking at images from everybody's work, so I'm not going to introduce them individually right now, but please join me in thanking Sam Alden, Emily Carroll, Blaise Laramie, and Rebecca Mock for being here today. Okay, so I assembled this panel because I wanted to talk about some of the various issues that have to do with making art, comics, and graphics um, for online platforms, um, sometimes very intentionally, sometimes unintentionally work takes on a life online that maybe it didn't take on in print. Um, because obviously we're all living in a period of and it sounds cliche to talk about it, but we're definitely living in a period of huge media transformation right now. Um, a lot of industries have been shaken up, uh, and, and really nobody knows for sure what's going to happen to them. There are a lot of people who position themselves as experts, but really where things will shake out is anyone's guess. What's going to happen to traditional print publishing? What's going to happen? I mean, we're, we're probably going to see pretty much the death of the newspaper in our lifetime, right? That's pretty close. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. And th that creates a lot of material for artists also, um, uh, certainly. So I, w I wanted to talk to these artists because they've all made work that I think has flourished online for various reasons. Um, and a lot of those reasons have to do with some aspect of what we might call medium specificity. This is the most corporate looking slide I've ever made in my <laughs> life. I'm, I'm actually really proud of how medium specific this is. This is like baseline zero PowerPoint slide. Normally I don't ever use bullet points, but I kind of like these um, images from the 90s of, of visualizations of how the internet was going to transform our culture and ourselves. I, I have a lot more of these, but I just, I'm using this and this uh, image from Sega's Mega Man video game. Um, <clears throat> just keeping it light. Okay, so, but uh, medium specificity, what do I mean by that? You know, well, I, um, I have a master's in media studies, which is a pretty vague uh, uh, subject to have a master's in, but uh, this issue of medium specificity comes up a lot. Um, you know, some of the Popular expressions of these concepts uh, come from Marshall McLuhan, uh, who you may recall from his uh, turn in Annie Hall, his brief cameo there. He uh, you know, famously said, the medium is the message, right? And, and, and that transforms a lot of our, our thinking about media. And what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about art on the internet is that you have this kind of, um, there are two areas of potential that have to do with digital media. One is, and I promise I'm not going to talk too much longer. Uh, one is um, mode of production, right? I mean, what is the art made with? Is it made with computer stuff or is it made with other stuff, right? I mean, there's certainly a lot of art that we see online that's made using digital tools. And, I mean, Rage Comics or, you know, other things like that that show their digitalness in the way that they're made. And then there's also the mode of dissemination that has to do with the devices and platforms. So there's some work that's very hand-drawn looking, but it is disseminated digitally, okay? And we'll see examples of Sam's work. Uh, it's on both sides. Um, but and that has to do with devices, meaning screens, computers, cell phones, whatever, tablets. It also has to do with the platforms, too. Uh, I mean, obviously, web browser. It could also mean Tumblr, which has a specific way of doing things. It could mean Instagram. It could mean a lot of different kinds of things. Different people present their work in different ways. Yesterday, Michael DeForge was talking about how he stopped using Tumblr because he didn't like the way his art was always mixed in with a lot of other random stuff, and he prefers to just put it on his website. That's his choice. Um, so anyway, and of course, these things are interactive, and that's a big difference between digital and print, too. Um, and so then, when you're thinking about you know, mode of production, mode of dissemination, then there's a the question of how does this affect the art? Right? How does it change the art? How does it change the content? Um, it could change the visual content, certainly, if it's work that's made digitally, work that's intended to be seen 
at 72 DPI on a screen versus, you know, in a photography art book. Um, it can also change the actual content, right? Maybe shorter pieces work better on the internet than longer pieces, maybe not. Um, you know, who's the audience? The audience is very different, right? There's different kind of people who go online looking for comics than people who might look at the graphic novel section of politics and prose or, you know, someplace like that that has a very different kind of uh, audience. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of, is there a feedback loop here? Does the audience shape the content? Do people make certain kinds of things for the internet? because the internet likes certain kinds of things, right? I think we've all seen stuff like that, you know? Uh, and then that also relates, of course, to the culture, the culture of the internet. And that has to do sometimes with what people on the internet like and are into. Sometimes it goes even deeper with, you know, various things that happen on Tumblr and Twitter where people start to almost organize around certain sets of values. Um, and sometimes arguments erupt. I think we've all <laughs> seen some of that kind of stuff. Or, you know, and it also has to do maybe with a culture of sharing. I think some artists, for example, have struggled with the fact that their stuff gets retumbled or reblogged somehow without their name attached to it or without the original source attached to it. Okay, I mean, those are other kinds of cultural values that also have to do with the way the technology allows you to interact with the art. Right. So anyway, there's, there's a whole package of complicated issues surrounding this stuff. I think all of these artists have done work that has flourished online f because it engages some or all aspects of what we're talking about here. Um, so I'd like to, i just like, kind of like to go um, one at a time uh, and, and look at art uh, from some of our panelists um, and, and, you know, keeping these issues in mind. Um, Rebecca, I, I've seen um, I've seen this image of yours online that was very specifically, I think, for some kind of manga or romance-themed anthology, right? Uh, shonen anthology. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, in 1998. And when you posted this online, I think, I don't remember um, exactly what you wrote, but you said something like, this is like more the kind of thing I did when I was much younger, or the kind of thing I was into when I was much younger. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. The reading of comics and talking in them was how I started drawing comics, so it was cool to circle back around. Mm -hmm. And I actually did a page after that one, about six months later, after I had completed the entire book. And the style, going back again, the style had changed since six months before, so like continuing to go back to this first style, this origin style, was like the bridge to the goal. Mm -hmm. And did you study, you studied illustration? Yes. Okay, and where did you go again? Micah. Micah, here in Maryland. And um, the work, I think probably some of the work of yours uh, that I first saw without necessarily um, uh, knowing right away who you were was some of your illustration work. And this is an image of yours that I've seen a lot. Uh, what was this, where did this run again? And at this point, um, you know, you've developed a style that um, I'm assuming uh, reflects work with, uh, reflects means of digital, digital means of production. Are you working on a tablet or is this, you work on a Cintiq? Okay. And at what point did you adop adopt that as your major material, or your major platform for making art? Here's another uh, example that I think speaks to that. Um, now you had said before that your intention initially was to combine uh, traditional and, and digital media. It seems like you're working strictly in digital, but the, something about the way that you construct 
the art or the something about the aesthetic is informed by traditional media? Uh -huh. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I assume, you know, you're, you're working in illustration. It's a very, you know, busy field in, in a kind of, there's a lot of kind of friendly competitiveness within illustration and you see other people who are working and getting certain kinds of assignments. And increasingly, I feel like I notice looking in magazines like the New Yorker or other places, um, you know, like more and more I'm seeing stuff where I just like notice right away, like, oh, that was made digitally, even though it has all these other characteristics, sometimes it's very, even painterly, mm -hmm. um, but there are things like just, it's hard to describe, but certain like brush forms or, or textures or things like that. Are there pitfalls that you identify or things that you try to avoid in that area? Um, yeah, it's interesting because it seems like there are two approaches to digital art, and the one is um, is a word called uh, re remediation, where you kind of disguise the process by which something is made. You know, so it's like uh, you know, you, you, so you never see like the stage hands on a TV show or something. Like that. It's all been remedi remediated to simulate reality, right? Or there's the other side, which is the more I mean, almost like a modernist approach, which is like pixel art or something like that. That's like very much upfront about this is the tool that I'm using yeah, to make this stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that you might, um, at some point, incorporate things that have more of a, a kind of very specific digital edge to it, or are you really pursuing this kind of fine balance? Um, well, and, you know, that certainly three-dimensionality, like, or at least the simulation of three-dimensionality is one of the things that digital can do. Another, um, and this is something that people in comics also kind of grapple with, is that it inc can incorporate movement, right? And with comics especially, we get really hung up on this concept of, like, oh, if it can move, is it still a comic or something? But um, I, I, I found um, some images of yours that were very popular online and, and uh, um, 
you know, were kind of, it seemed like endlessly like recirculated on Tumblr and things like this. Uh, these images that you made that are kind of like right on the edge of uh, almost like um, illustrations of digital things. It gives you clean edges that are like the products that would be hard to get by hand. The digital platform makes the little animation possible and then the digital, uh, the, the, the online uh, social media makes it viral. You know, like there's a lot happening with these images. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you started making these kinds of, um, I guess we could call them animated illustrations. I remember also um, uh, probably um, the other related area that I, of, of work that's like this that I'd seen online are these images that people are calling cinemagraphs. Yeah. Had you seen these also? Was that yeah, sort of influential on you? Um, and one thing I should just say is that these, these GIFs uh, are being displayed via PowerPoints at the wrong scale, and sometimes they're not quite 100% as smooth as they are when people look at them on your website, so people should definitely uh, look for them there. Um, how do you, um, how do you is, is there a process by which you arrive at one of these kind of looping events or moments that you think is going to work visually and also have some kind of narrative content that you're comfortable with? Um, now, one of the issues with, with digital art uh, that comes up a lot, and, and actually I was talking to someone about this earlier, is um, if you're making, I mean, these, what's beautiful about these things is that they're so ephemeral, they can like only exist as they are on the internet. Yeah. But, but um, the internet is not good at paying people for their work. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, you know, so, I mean, there's, it's a kind of interesting thing where, I know, um, for example, you make print versions of your illustrations, and some of these are just still single images, so it's a kind of natural thing. But then, you know, it occurs to me looking at the selection of prints that, oh, some of these are, are the animated images, like the laptop thing. So, like a print, you have to select a moment, and that's what the print is going to be, a moment within the moment, and that's what the print is going to be, and it's never going to have that 
quality that the animated version has. But I assume this is important because people, you know, maybe want to buy stuff from you, and why would you not want to sell it to them, right? I, I think some of the pieces they do are appropriate with grades because uh -huh. they don't hold their own when they're still. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, and I do, I do want to make work that works both as a still image because a lot of the commission or a lot of the work I've done editorial has been for print and for web. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of your work too because um, I feel like uh, over the last one or two years, kind of like some of Rebecca's illustrations, your work has been heavily shared and commented upon online. Which I, I think a lot of people, I know in some cases like Hawaii, you may have made a mini comic first or something, but probably, and now it's been reprinted into a book, but I think probably the, right at this moment, the overwhelming majority of people who have seen it have seen it online. Um, how did, wh when did you start posting your work online? Um, it was actually pretty, uh, pretty late in the game. I've been drawing comics forever and I, I registered like a social media account for the first time like four years ago or something. And, um, and I've been on Tumblr since then. And that's when I started putting my stuff online. Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until the last year that I was getting any uh, attention for it. Um, but, uh, yeah. um, why do you think this story was uh, so successful online? Because I know like you had done some online serials in the past. There were some projects that you started when you were much younger that you, know, you kind of moved away from to do other things. Do you have any thoughts about why, and I know this is a tricky question for any artist to answer, but why people really locked onto this? Um, you know, I mean, I think one thing is it's very simple. It's, it's a comic that you can read um, incredibly fast, especially if you're scrolling and you're maybe not registering each page as a page. It's just kind of a series of images scrolling by and like an animation. Um, I mean, I, I think it's also fair to say that there's, like I've done other stories um, that went online uh, about, I don't know, heavier themes. I did one that was sort of about incest and, uh, and trauma, and I've, I've just done more complicated stories. And I think there's, uh, there's a simplicity that the internet <laughs> really loves about, um, I don't know, like, one one or two characters like moving through space mostly without dialogue um, that's I don't know it's it does a lot of the work for the audience yeah. I think I think part of um, I, I think there are a lot of reasons why um, people like this work I mean for one thing it's just beautifully drawn it's a you know kind of sensitive sort of poignant, you know, childhood reminiscence, you know, the, you know the, the, all of the kind of narrative qualities that it has independent of media, obviously, are part of it. Um, I think, um, I think, I think, though, that there's something about the online reading experience that this really worked for in the sense that it, as you were saying, you could, like, scroll and read it quickly, but it also felt like substantial, like you just read a short story or something like that. There's, it's sort of, I think in part because it's suggestive of maybe a bigger emotional experience and it's more panels than people usually read and it's read in a single like web strip or something like that. It kind of had that feeling of like, oh, like reading a short story in like a Mome or Kramer's Ergot type anthology, except you just did it in like a minute, scrolling, 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 you know? There's, there's also something about, I think, uh, I know when I'm reading a comic online and I'm, it's really clearly handmade, um, which uh, Hawaii, I, I guess, is. I, I drew it like really tiny um, in a sketchbook with a mechanical pencil so that you can see all the, the mistakes uh, and the texture of the paper and stuff. I, 
I think there's something about that that slows down the reading experience mm -hmm. um, and really clean digital edges to everything tends to speed up the reading experience um, and maybe that's you know on s maybe on some level that's just the like literally the human eye having to stop and parse like what an image means for a little longer but I, I think also like the presence of the artist's hand like creates this this other awareness that makes you go a little more slowly um, I think sometimes with uh, clean digital stuff, which I, I actually do a lot of and, and really enjoy, um, there's you're more aware of it as, it, it seems more like art that like the internet has created specially for you or something. And you're not thinking as much about somebody who had to sit in a room in like a specific place and draw it. Yeah, I agree with you entirely that the, the, um, the fact that it has a handmade look slows down, it sort of slows down the reading experience, which sort of creates a dynamic too with the rapid stroll, scrolling thing. And I think the other thing that's kind of iron, uh, ironic is that um, I've seen, I feel like I've seen a resurgence of very handmade looking art on the internet precisely because, you know, if you were working in colored pencil on watercolor paper or something like that, you know, five or 10 years ago, you could show it to someone, they'd say, oh, that's really nice, but that's too expensive to reproduce, right? Um, and now it's like, well, you can just scan it and show it to the world, and it doesn't matter if the paper has torn edges and stuff collaged on it or whatever. It's like, you scan it, and it looks perfect. It looks probably better. I mean, you know, you have more control over your contrast and the tone of the paper and stuff, manipulating it digitally than you would have printing this in a book ever, you know, because you're left with the vagaries of ink density and how it hits the paper and, you know, all those things change unless you're like doing a really high-end art book with really, you know, luxurious materials. Like, you kind of have to let a certain, you have to leave a certain margin for it not looking <laughs> exactly the way you want it to in terms of color and contrast and things like that. Whereas on the internet, you could futz with this endlessly uh, until it looks exactly the way that you want it to. And what people see on their screens, you know, barring color profile change or whatever, is, is going to be the same thing that you see on your screen. Um, and I, I've actually photoshopped my hand-drawn comics to look more hand-drawn. Um, <laughs> like, like I've gone in and added hairs on the scanner and like smudges and things. Really? Yeah, not for this one, but for later ones, which where I, I kind of had my shit together a little more and was drawing them more cleanly. Okay. Like, oh, got it. <laughs> like, is this an example? Like, when the, for these books, did you do that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Add in smudges, or is uh, this? Uh, yeah, there's some there's some fake smudging on this, <laughs> uh, on this page. Yeah, yeah, it was. I literally had a smudge page that I just like stuck my hands over, and I would just put that on a multiply layer and mess with it sometimes. Um, and, and you work in a, you, you've always kind of, um, you know, we did a panel at MoCA where we talked about visual style and development of visual style. And you've changed your style a lot um, and experimented with a lot of different things. This was from a story you did for the Mold Map Anthology. And obviously this looks very different from Hawaii 1997. Um, but uh, very surprisingly to me, you've recently been making pixel art. Like, I like this transition between June 23rd and June 24th. It's like in two days, you see this incredible stylistic range from very, like, expressive pencil art to very flat uh, graphic pixel art. And you've been doing uh, a series of, of comic strips in this manner. Can you talk, um, and I can show a few images uh, from, from different strips so people who haven't seen this work can get a sense of it. But can you talk about how you started making this work and why uh, you like working with this medium? Um, well, the, the specific origin is I got really freaked out about the pencil stuff um, because I felt like I couldn't actually draw well enough to, to justify asking for people's money for my comics and stuff. And I, I was sad this winter. Um, that, was, that was the origin of this stuff and I, um, I started doing the pixel stuff because it was with this uh, this janky MS Paint program that I uh, I didn't didn't really work very well and didn't always erase. Sometimes it would just delete the file when you tried to erase. <laughs> <laughs> so it 
Um, and I was I didn't have a, a Wacom tablet or anything, so this is all drawn on a trackpad, like my my laptop trackpad. And um, I think I I had to like it was it was sort of about relinquishing uh, control, but at the same time I could go in and like add like fix individual pixels. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I, I feel like I lost the thread of that. So this was this was something that you did it sounds like as a kind of response to maybe people looking at a particular style of your art or was it a sense of expectation that people wanted the internet wants another Hawaii, Hawaii 1998 or something or uh, yeah uh -huh. yeah totally the internet or like my publisher or <laughs> 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 and uh, and I, I mean I am working on more uh, pencil stuff but uh, yeah, I think there's a certain amount of uh, of like comfort that I took in making these images that I had um, uh, was both in like unfamiliar territory with and also uh, had more control over. Yeah. Were there reference points for you, like video games you liked as a kid or something like that? Uh, yeah, I. Uh, I think you, you kind of go to video game nostalgia a lot when you look at, at pixel art, but I was also thinking of like um, just my like my dad's old like Apple II computer mm -hmm. or like whatever Apple I had in like 1997 when I was a kid and, and like the way that the trash bin looked mm -hmm. um, uh, and like, oh, yeah. Did you ever play uh, like The Manhole? It was like this game that those guys who made Mist made before they made Mist. It was like all kind of like hyper cardy and pixely, and the pixels were really obvious. Like it was each pixel was like an inch across. <laughs> yeah, it looked like that. Yeah, this is an upcoming print book that you have from. Is it Space Space who's publishing it? Uh, it's sorry. Uh, actually, it's I have it right here. Yeah. It's Sonatina. Oh, sorry, uh, Sonatina. Yeah. Oh, you have the book. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're making now digital art for print. After yeah. making handmade art for the internet. Yeah, I know. Okay. Well, and, and actually, this, I was going to talk about this a little earlier because I was kind of making these after uh, responding to that series of your paintings, Rebecca. Um, because I, what I, something I really liked about those was how um, they were all about this. There was always like a screen present, or there often was, and but it was also about like, like warmth and atmosphere and and summer and um, and I, I really liked the like that you were using the screen as part of that and it didn't seem like t to be some sort of cynical commentary on like look at this beautiful backyard and this guy's <laughs> just on his iPad I was like yeah that looks great to hang out in that backyard with that iPad <laughs> <laughs> um, so th like I this book was sort of trying to do the same thing but with skill or whatever. Um, and uh, Blaze, I want to look at some of your work because you've also um, got an incredible breadth of activity that you've manifested over the last several years, uh, both not just in terms of stylistic uh, stuff like Sam, although you have that, but also different types of activity, including editing and, and, and uh, you know, things that uh, seem to actually engage the culture of the internet as content. Um, probably um, the early work of yours that I'm guessing the most people uh, saw was, was Young Lions, uh, which you published, I think, with a Zarek grant in 2010. This was in a you know, very traditional, like, paperback book format. Um, it also felt, at the time, very, um, the, this PowerPoint is becoming self-aware. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it also um, felt like very progressive because um, I think a lot of people were starting to make comics for print um, that embrace the kind of handmade aesthetic that hadn't previously been part of comics culture. I think. I think especially in the last several years, CF is probably someone who's very influential on a lot of people and just saying like, 
look, you can leave the pencil marks in, you can leave the wrinkled paper in. And a lot of people have, have done very different kinds of things uh, since then. Um, but you followed this up with, with other kinds of work, uh, like digital stuff. And you, your webcomic 2001, uh, and it's you know very difficult to simulate this stuff in a PowerPoint, but this had a kind of endless scrolling type of quality with foreground characters that were sort of naturalistic and had a kind of almost smooth animation uh, against more abstracted um, backgrounds. Um, what led you to begin doing this kind of work in particular? Uh, I'm not sure, really. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, were you, w was this drawn, no, that's fine, that's totally fine. I don't necessarily expect that people need to be able to answer that question. Um, was this drawn uh, in a traditional way, or are you drawing? Uh, yeah, that was like ink on paper. Mm -hmm. And what is the process for making something like this? Were you drawing the foreground separate from background? Yeah, the background was uh, digital, and mm -hmm. the foreground was ink on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was sort of like thinking about digital stuff, but like more like digital world. It was kind of like a lo-fi thing in the sense that I was thinking of it like as a 3D like thing. Like it was so thought out, but like doesn't translate at all. But like where like this, the frame of the comic would be a square and that'd be like nine feet or something. And like then it'd all be like nine foot cubes that would make up the entire thing. Later on there's architecture here. It's just like the starry mm -hmm. background but they go to like a campus sort of thing. And so, yeah, it's like that virtual like throwback to like what we thought digital technology would be like in the future back in like whenever it was, like this would be the virtual world you'd be in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of like two characters like just walking around without much dialogue, that's pretty much this. Mm -hmm. If you're into that, Um, you, you will look at some of more of your work, but I also think of you as um, like a really uh, acute and insightful editor, um, in part because of um, this website, altcomics.tumblr.com, which I think is, you know, like one of the best websites about, com about comics that I've seen in a long time. But you don't write criticism, you just re, you post some original things, but you also re-blog a lot of things on Tumblr. And it's got this, it's just called Alt Comics, and it includes all kinds of stuff that people don't think of as comics, necessarily. I mean, you have, you know, quotes from painters like we see here, or, you know, a, a picture of this, you know, I am curious yellow, a kind of photo book. Uh, a post, you know, adapted from a film, um, you know, sometimes very provocative stuff. I mean, this is from the autopsy report of Michael Brown, but we see, you know, like, uh, you know, of course, it's a drawing, there's words, there's images, there's a kind of, you know, before and after, or front and back anyway, and an implied before and after. Um, sometimes you really, um, you know, you do some somewhat uh, pranksterish kinds of things. This. Uh, this image appeared on altcomics.tumblr.com where it seems less a, a commentary on the form of comics and more a kind of gesture that has something to do with the culture of comics. And of course, this gets hundreds of notes and people reblogging it and saying, is this real? Is this true? Did this really happen? And then some people reblogging it just to say like, this is a prank, guys, but in the process, like making it more viral. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that website's a good like illustration of how I think about like the internet, where it's like we've got these two tendencies sort of, and one's like basically just the tendency of like spam or like uh, search engine optimizers, which are like considered like the like lowliest scum of like I don't know, did, like programmers culture stuff like that, and it's just like link bait, click bait, all that kind of stuff. It's like it's just like a system. It's like massively multiplayer game. Like you just try to like accrue power in like kind of <laughs> obvious ways, and like it says at the bottom of the notes like whatever your power level is. <laughs> <laughs> so I have that, and then like so I'll get this power or whatever. Like I'll make like a like a fake account or whatever. I'll get like 
14,000 like subscribers to it or whatever, thinking it's someone else, and then like I'll just like crash it into the ground. So it's like <laughs> it sucks because like yeah I don't know because it's like I want to change things and stuff, but when I actually do have that whatever, it's like what do I do with it? I just kind of like dick around sort of. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's there's some some uh, pieces that you've posted online um, that really seem to address you know this kind of like power that people can gain on the internet, where the next thing you know people are talking about you, and that you've made these. I mean, these almost seem like you know like sketches on a on a hip hop album or something, where people are kind of like calling out other people or whatever. And you know, here like you know sometimes people are tweeting about you, and then you'll make these graphics like on your uh, more. A, web, a Tumblr that's dedicated more to your work, but of course is named after the famous uh, artist David Hawking. Um, so you know, it's it seems like you you like to be part of this kind of online discussion, although you're not direct. You don't like to directly answer these kinds of statements or questions. Is that accurate? Yeah, I like to be defined by like my audience. I like to be like a projection screen, and you can like say whatever I am, and then I'll be that. I see that as like a way of like, I mean that's ideal. It's kind of like the same thing before, where it's like I have that tendency, and then I also just want to serve myself in a way that like, how fast can I get people to unfollow me? Like, but yeah, it's like, um, also I like like listening to people, what people are saying to me, like maybe more than like actually like engaging with that. I don't know. It's like I like thinking of myself as like an other rather than like being like the person they're talking to. Do you think that the um, sort of uh, anonymity or semi-anonymity of the internet uh, enables those tendencies or helps yeah. you do that? It's also like I think of artists as like celebrities, basically. Like it's the same culture. Like if you're an artist, you're like society's role. That's like you're a hyper individual. You're like super autonomous. You're like, um, I don't know, that kid in like Neon Genesis Evangelion. You're like the chosen one. You can just express whatever you want, sort of, and you struggle with that role, but like, you're supposed to have total freedom. And, and so you also have this great responsibility, so people are always like, and then, but to be free of that, you have to be like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'll do whatever I want. But it's all a performance, and so I think about that. Um, one of the things that um, I like about some of the work that you post is that um, you sort of, th there's, a, there's a kind of appropriation to it, and you're almost like showing how much stuff there is out there on the internet that can be used as like a blank canvas of some kind or another. There's a series of images that I really like that are kind of like the um, 2001 comic where it's got these similar looking characters in a foreground background separation, but you're you're using usually um, installation shots, I guess, from gallery and museum websites, and it's to me these are like so liberating because the characters are doing all these things you're like never supposed to do in a gallery. <laughs> They're like jumping on the art and stuff totally. like that. Yeah. Um, do you think or, or do you present these as um, either? critiques or reviews of the shows in any way? They Do you definitely think like interface with it and they like kind of activate them, you know? You have all this like 3D stuff that's represented in a 2D image. And this is like documentary images are like how I encounter art like 99% of the time. I don't go to shows. I read books that have like images in them and like I'll see images online. And so this is just a way to like interact with it in a virtual kind of 2D way. Mm -hmm. And okay. comment on it. I mean, it's always like well chosen, or there's like you know reasons I choose each thing. Um, and uh, <coughs> I just wanted to show a couple of other images. I think the um, kind of going this is a l maybe a little bit like Rebecca's work. This kind of putting like just the right amount of motion into an image so it doesn't feel like a movie, but it still has some kind of status as a as an image as a, as an image. And I see you doing this sometimes with. Um, really stuff that to me I think we can look at as possibilities for where comics can go in interactive media without necessarily losing their status as comics. Um, particularly, I, I like these ones where you've got uh, almost like a, a, a video underlying um, 
a comics page and almost like transforming it as, as the thing is looping around. And of course, I'm guessing these images are all like, are they from like Snapchat or some? They're like um, tumblr.com slash tag slash, um, I forgot, it's from Jeff Maker. Uh -huh. Yeah. Jeff mm -hmm. Yo? Okay. This one's mainly like, their population is like tweens use it. They're on the cutting edge. That one. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, uh, I mean, I feel like you have some kind of uh, sense of, of comics and, and what comics can be and a, a, a sense of maybe wanting to expand that that seems implicit in alt comics. When you make work like this, or is this, um, are you thinking about this as like other ways that comics can be that you're more actively involved with rather than reblogging or retumbling other people's things at all? Do you I think, think it's like why I like was weird answering the first question because I feel like um, the actual making of the work and stuff is um, something that lends itself less to language where I interact with language a lot but it's mostly like theory and other ways of thinking, I don't know. Just like, so words, using them to describe like artistic process, that's something that I'm less comfortable doing. But yeah, I can under, I can like describe less how the image is created than how it can like move around and be disseminated and all that interesting stuff. And you have, um, you have a, a, a print book coming out fairly soon, I think in 2015, early 2015, called Ice Cream Kisses. It's coming from 2D Cloud. Um, and I guess this is, I know you, you've made a lot of zines, some of them very small editions, sometimes it's editions of one over the years. Um, I guess this is your first um, kind of uh, con conventionally formatted book since Young Lions. Um, di did you, since you are thinking about how things get around and stuff, did you think about that, this book, how it's going to be presented in a different context than the stuff that you put online? Yeah, it's so hard thinking about like a book. Like, I'm just online so much that it's like thinking about like stacking up content, being offline, and having like an image population of like 96 or like however many like hundreds of pages. Like it's just such a weird different experience. And then how does that relate to online? Because I kept thinking like, okay, so each spread has to be like something that someone could like take a photo of in the bookstore and like upload to whatever and be like, this is this book and it has to represent it sort of. So it's like each, yeah, it's just like hard to think. Well, Emily, uh, you've had to think about the this difference between print and online recently because you've been posting a lot of stories online, sometimes things that seem like they're really designed for the internet. And now you've just recent, did your book out now? The yep, yes, it's it came out. out like maybe like a month ago? In July. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of people, I think, really uh, encountered your work online and really fell in love with it. Um, one story that really got passed around a lot, I feel like I'm saying really a lot, um, but one story that got passed around quite a bit, I, um, I, I'm sure I have a vocabulary, uh, it was his face all red. Uh, I, I remember seeing this link to in many different places. Um, do you have any thoughts yourself about why this story uh, appealed to readers online so strongly? Um, well, I'm sort of obvious not particularly interesting answer is that it was, it's a horror comic and I released it on Halloween. <laughs> um, so I think people like, any time there's anything like Halloween based on Halloween, especially scary stuff, people want to just like pass it around. So it was on Twitter, I guess, that it got. Because um, I'm, I'm not on Tumblr, but I'm on Twitter a lot. So um, I sort of had a, a network of friends that were already cartoonists and people followed them to find out about new comics and whatever. So I think it just, that's how it disseminated. Um, and one of the things that is striking to me about this, I think there are a few things. Um, for one, kind of like Hawaii in 1997, it has, has a feeling of being a substantial thing. Like it's not just, oh, here's a fun little one page of a work in progress. It's not like a little comic strip. You read it and you kind of feel like you read like a short story in an anthology. It's, it's substantial. Um, it's you know, beautifully drawn, great colors that look good on a screen. But I think a big part of the appeal, too, is that it's really designed for a, w a website. Like, it's, you, you know, this, 
doesn't export well probably to Tumblr because you've really, I think, built the HTML pages and designed the images yeah. in such a way I that you slaved away on the HTML. <laughs> so well, I don't know. No, it's it's like the most basic stuff I learned in grade six. Oh, I know. Yeah, sure. But, but like um, but the it point simply is that it, there's. Uh, this is something that's meant to be seen a certain way. Like th it's meant to scroll a certain way. You've broken up the pages a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like you've paced the 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 pages out. Well, uh, initially, like this is. <laughs> I feel like I got a lot of credit when this comic went around for like timing and pacing, and I hadn't heard of like the what's it called, the infinite canvas or something. I was literally just doing whatever was most convenient for me in the like the path of least resistance and putting it up. So like initially. The whole story, I think it's like 10 clicks or something, mm -hmm. uh, which I heard people complaining about online, <laughs> that they were constantly clicking 10 times. Um, <laughs> but it was initially supposed to be one big long scroll, um, and that was just because, a and that was easiest, to just put it all up in one thing, but it was taking too long to load, so I just broke it up at places that seemed natural, and you know, a lot of the, the work I do and how I break it up online, it's much more intuitive and then um, you know I, I realized later like oh that was a maybe a smart decision to do that but at the time I'm not really I'm literally just doing whatever I think is like most convenient to me and on Tumblr like like um, I heard uh, Michael DeForge say that uh, yesterday that um, he stopped putting his comics on Tumblr because he didn't like sort of all the other things around them he wanted to really control uh, the appearance of his comic and it, it's very much the same way like for this comic and most of my comics since their horror, um, well, not all of them, but I like to keep like that black background mm -hmm. everywhere. And literally up until this comic, I had been posting everything on LiveJournal. The only time I, the only reason <laughs> I initially got a website uh, was be so that I could put this up on a pure black background mm -hmm. without like mm -hmm. that goat at the top or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was <laughs> the thinking behind that. Yeah, you can use this one. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> did anything visually happen? I just heard a sound, right? It was only, okay. I'm, like there's no fuse that went off, like my computer is not slowly melting in a way that I'm not aware of. Okay. This, um, is, this is actually my, my new comic. This is my <laughs> it's, it's a sound-based comic and it lasts for half a second. Wow. I'm really, yeah, liking it. I'm liking it. Um, okay. Uh, well, I th one of the things about this work is y even if um, you know you're just intuitively dividing it up, like the some of the ways that you paste it really did increase the drama quite a bit. I mean, I'm not going to show the last image, although I bet like a dollar that a lot of people in this room have read this story already. Um, and you've also done work that really feels like it can only exist online. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the three snake leaves, which has a kind of um, almost like a choose your own adventure kind <laughs> of element yeah. where you get to a, a certain point in the story and you have to select one of two paths. Um, what, uh, what led you to experiment with this kind of interactive storytelling? Had you seen examples of this kind of thing online um, before? Were you thinking of video games? Well, yeah, oh yeah, video games influence a lot of the storytelling. Um, mm. And I really like kind of choose your own adventure things um, mm. and RPGs and things where two people can, or multiple people can play the same thing, the same game, but because it's kind of branches, they have a completely different experience to it and makes it um, much more personal to them. Um, which is partly because I get very possessive of <laughs> video games, and so I don't like playing things that everyone else plays exactly like me, because that's mine. Um, but uh, for this one, I think I used um, rollovers on certain images. Um, so like at the bottom, when you, you roll over, um, it's an adaptation of a fairy tale. When you roll over the, the prince or princess fighting their way out of this crypt, um, you then see how the story unfolds. Um, it, it's the same story, um, but you kind of align with a different character, mm -hmm. and it's colored by um, their experience of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just literally because I saw a website that like, just some crappy website that had like a rollover on the like, click here button. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. I should find a way to do that and use it in some comic. And then so I eventually just used it in this. 
And are you typically drawing using um, traditional media or using tablet? This one was a mix. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was drawn in pencil the, for the characters, mm -hmm. um, and then all the frippy, like, ornamental stuff was done digitally. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of mix um, digital and um, traditional. But I usually, like, I kind of have, with my comics, I'll make sort of like a collage of images, and then I will piece them all together um, in panels so that I can control them uh, because I'm way too messy uh, just drawing normally. You mean by collage that you kind of draw the images sort of all over the page and not quite as rigidly paneled and yeah. then digitally you sort of bring things into alignment? Yeah, like I think th these were all drawn at once, but usually I'll draw yeah. like the characters all separately and then um, the backgrounds all separately and then I'll have like ink washes mm. and bits of pencil and stuff and I will assemble them all okay. on Photoshop. But that, so like that comic, the Three Snake Leaves one is definitely only online, but the, his face all red is the only webcomic that's in my book. And I had to adapt it for print. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So you just had this book that came out very recently and it includes his face all red and then four brand new stories. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is a much, you know, over, you know compared to the webcomic stuff, you're really, um, it, it's a much more constrained project in some ways because you are limited to this field of the rectangular page and everything's got to go page by page and be paced within that overall structure. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about adapting his face all red and what some of the maybe more difficult aspects of that might have been. Uh, yeah, uh, so when I was pitching this book, I think um, like my publisher wanted his face all red because it was my best known comic and I hadn't made a book before and so I was like, well, I can probably adapt that one for print because Again, like it was one of my earliest comics, and it wasn't that I was like trying to make a statement or anything by putting it online or making it a digital comic. It was literally just because I didn't know how to print comics, and I didn't care to find out how. <laughs> um, so that one was sort of easier to do. I think there, I think it it does work better um, online, to be honest. Um, I think that uh, the kind of there are sequences in it that are are much more um, given to the scrolling aspect than a page turning aspect. But I still, I still think it works okay. Um, but I did have to uh, um, change a lot of panels around. I re-lettered the whole thing. Um, I fixed some grammatical errors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, but uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it came out okay. But um, I think my main focus on the book was kind of getting used to drawing, creating comics specifically for print mm -hmm. from the get-go rather than adapting, like I would never want to adapt any of my other web comics for print, it's just not possible. Um, it seems like there could be two challenges, I mean one of them is aesthetics in terms of, you know, just basic things of course like resolution, but also having a sense of what kind of color is going to look good on a page and, and how things are going to print. Um, of course the other big one is working within the constraints of uh, the page format, the book format. Mm -hmm. Were there um, did you find any advantages or disadvantages to working in the book format after working online? Um, well, one of the things that I really wanted the book to look like, and what, what I, like, I think a lot of my writing and drawing is um, influenced by children's picture books, mm -hmm. and so I actually got to create a book that looked like, it, I want to like evoke the feeling of a picture book. Um, so that was very much in my mind um, when I was making it. Mm -hmm. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Was there anything, I mean, did you feel after you were doing this like you were eager for the freedom of the, the web uh, format again or did you come to appreciate the kind of discipline that's required by the book format? Um, I do like them both. I, I have a fun time kind of sorting out either one. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I like um, the immediacy of doing the web stuff. Like most of my web comics are made in a couple weeks or maybe a little, little more. Um, and, and then I can just kind of get them out and they're all short stories. So mm -hmm. once I'm done with them, like I'm done with them. I don't need to wait to see like how it will look when it's printed. I don't need like an editor to tell me like, I'll get back to you in a week on this or something mm -hmm. like this. I can just decide and put it out. So mm -hmm. um, for me, my web comics are like a huge um, kind of um, a thing to pour my anxiety into mm -hmm. during lar larger mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. and focus on. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, like, I like them both, though. I, I think I'm going to be doing more of both in the future. Well, I mean, you're someone who's put, you know, I, I think everyone on this panel okay. has put 
a lot of free content on the internet. Um, has anyone, have you thought about, like, is there gonna be forever in my life a distinction between, like, stuff that I put online for free and then using that as a, kind of to parlay that or leverage that to, you know, get paying work and do other kind of work that way? Um, or is anyone thinking about how do I actually try and in some way support myself through the internet, through whatever mechanisms might be available now or perhaps might come up in the future? Um, no, in a, well, for me, when I first started making comics, I had no, like, aspirations whatsoever that I would ever make money on it or ever to be a cartoonist or anything like that. I was, I had a day job and I was just doing this for fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if I started somehow charging money for the web comics, I would stop wanting to do them because I would feel like they needed to be good. <laughs> um, so, like, I think, like, now, like, I can kind of do them and, and if it doesn't, you know, I can experiment a lot more with them and if it doesn't really work, then, you know, no great loss. I'll, I'll do better on it next time. And, um, but uh, I think it has uh, parlayed into um, job opportunities for me in print, and so I'm sort of happy to have that be my job and uh, have web comics be like fun, fun. Yeah. Does, does anyone else have any other thoughts on that issue? The issue of is it you know possible to earn a living making work art for the internet or? I have a thought that it's like kind of like um, the intern model where it's like you have to work for free kind of for a while to do stuff, and then like I don't know. It's sort of like everyone like it's just a function of your privilege, kind of what, how you end up like. It seems like it all boils down to that sort of like how much time you have. Like how much like time you have to come to these things to like socialize, like how much time you can like just spend doing stuff for free, you know, without any I don't know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a certain there is a certain amount of privilege to it. Like you do have to be in a place where you have enough uh, you have enough time to spare and you have enough money to spare to put things out online for free. And it's the the it was saying also that uh, the reward center in your brain is responds equally to money and um, internet fame. <laughs> <laughs> it's, they've done a study. <laughs> That's true. They, uh, so it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it, as long as, you know, as long as you're safe, safe somewhere, then it's fine if uh, we're putting all this out for free. And I thought that was a really good point that um, you, it, do, it doesn't matter, because it's free, it doesn't matter whether anyone likes it. Like there's a fear, especially if you're doing this as a job, if, Web comics is your life. That uh, if no one likes what you do, then you'll become irrelevant, and then you'll die. Um, <laughs> well, I worry about that too, just in general. <laughs> I think that's a general fear. Yeah, yeah that you'll you'll eventually become. Uh, that if you stop producing something, if you're a web artist, then no one will really care because it costs nothing for them to stop following you. If they've made no investment in your future, um, but also because the internet is free for everyone, because it's a free for all. You And on that note, uh, I think that's a great way to end this. Please join me in thanking our panelists for being here today.